Hi, hello everyone, and welcome to the first YouTube live from the IEEE list run branch. My name is Julien Duforet, and I am your host today. And I'm very pleased to welcome Assistant Professor Jadeep Kolkarni today. Hello, Jadeep. Uh, hi, Julien. How are you? I'm very, very good. How are you today? I'm doing well. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. We are, we are very happy to have you today. So for the for our viewers who may know, not know him, so JD received his Bachelor of Engineering degree from the University of Pune, India in 2002. His um, uh, degree from the Indian Institute of, of Science in 2004 and his PhD degree from the Purdue University in 2009. And during 2009 to 2017, he worked as a research scientist at Intel Circuit Research Lab in Hillsboro, Oregon. And he's currently the assistant professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. And he's a fellow of Silicon Labs in chair in electrical engineering and a fellow of AMD chair in computer engineering. He has filed 36 patents, published two book chapters and 75 papers in referral journals and conferences. His research is focused on machine learning, hardware accelerators, in-memory computing, emerging node devices, heterogeneous and 3D integrated circuits, hardware security, and cryogenic comput computing. And um, if you have any question during the talk, please write them in the in the comments, and we ask them at the end of the talk. And JD. Thank you again for accepting our invitation and the uh, floor is yours for the presentation. Okay, great. Uh, so thanks a lot, uh, Julian, for your kind introduction. And uh, and also I would like to thank IEEE uh, Lilly student chapter for inviting me and giving me an opportunity to present this work uh, uh, to you and, uh, and share my experiences with uh, uh, high performance embedded memory design in advanced FinFET technologies. So this is the outline of my talk. I'll briefly start with the motivation as to why it matters uh, designing this high performance embedded memory circuits. And then I will briefly touch upon the pixel scaling trend that is currently happening in the embedded memories uh, world. And then I'll start upon uh, the fundamental uh, bit cell design for the static random access memory bit cell. And then I will move on to something called as the women assist techniques, the circuit techniques which are used to lower the operating voltage of these memory arrays. And then I will briefly talk about some of the other considerations, uh, such as the interconnect issues or some of the multiport memories in this uh, advanced technologies. And finally, I will touch upon number, uh, some of the emerging applications of SRAMs or embedded memories in, uh, in the computing memory design space, which is targeted for ML, AI, or any data intensive workloads. And, and towards the end, I will summarize with the key uh, message for designing these high performance memories. So let's begin with the motivation as to why it matters, why these high performance memories matters, the embedded memories. So if you start with the trend that is happening in the computing devices and how it translates into the total memory capacity and uh, the total energy. So if we start with the plot on the left, top left, which shows the number of compute devices plotted in the log Y axis as a function of time, in a year on the x-axis. And we see that the number of computing devices which are deployed worldwide, they are, uh, they are growing exponentially. And by around 2030, 2040 time frame, there will be around 1 trillion compute devices in various shapes and forms. So what does that mean for the overall compute energy and compute uh, uh, the memory capacity? So if you look at the plot on the right, which shows the amount of memory capacity uh, that is required as a function of, again, time. So 
if you have so many devices, trillions of devices uh, in the world, that will result into around 10 to the power 40 compute operations per year. And in order to do so much number crunching, we would need 70 million zettabytes of memory and one zettabyte being 10 to the power 21 bytes. So in order to perform so much computation, in order to move the data in and out of these zettabytes of memory, we would need of the order of 10 zeta joules of compute energy just to perform the computation. And that is becoming a significant portion or at least a tangible portion of world's total energy uh, consumption and production. So what is going to happen is there is going to be this data deluge in or the data explosion or humongous or abundant data uh, in the future energy constraint computing system because the energy that is available to us to perform this huge number of computation is still going to be limited. So we need to manage this data deluge in a very energy efficient way. So let's look at some of the uh, application domains and see how memory technology is playing a role. So let's start with the extreme low power IoT computing, which is at the very low end of the compute spectrum. And if you take a look at uh, any representative uh, IoT uh, microcontroller, so this one is uh, less than one millimeter square area. Uh, this was presented by Intel in VLSI Symposium 2016. And for such a tiny die area, you could see that uh, different areas allocated to the uh, memory arrays. And more than 50% of the die area is uh, occupied by the memories. And this particular microcontroller implements around 80 kilobytes of on-chip memory. And in order to lower the operating voltage, which is also known as the V-min, and I'm going to talk about it in subsequent slides, they have utilized a, a unique trans bit cell called as the eight transistor one read one write port bit cell that allows you to scale the supply voltage. But that comes at a higher area cost and in order to reduce the leakage, uh, they have used a high VT transistor, high threshold voltage transistor, which also increased the bit cell area. So the point I want to make is that even in this tiny uh, microcontroller silicon footprint, you can see that memory occupies a significant portion for this uh, extreme low power IoT compute uh, blocks. Now let's look at the other end of the spectrum and look at what is happening at the very high performance exascale computing system. So the figure on the left shows a generic uh, architecture of such an exascale system. It consists of different processor chips, which has a lot of throughput oriented cores. They have their own level two cache memories, and then they interact with the main memory, the DRAM, dynamic random access memory. Multiple of such processor chips, they form nodes, node forms module, module forms cabinet. And all of these hierarchies are connected to various levels of uh, cabinet level interconnect, system level interconnect. Now, if you focus on the plot on the right, which shows the normalized energy access per unit operation, and this energy per access is normalized with respect to the on-chip register file energy, which is the local uh, very near to the processing unit. We notice that these green bars are essentially the amount of energy that is required in order to access the data from the on-chip memories, such as the register files, L1 cache, L2 cache. The moment we go off chip, for example, in case of DRAM, it has more than 256x higher energy uh, compared to the on-chip memory access. And as we go farther and farther away from the on-chip memories, you can notice that these red bars, it takes more and more amount of energy uh, to bring this data all the way from a farther location of the system onto a given processing unit. So the point here is this exascale system, the data movement is costly compared to the on-die memory access. And in the future, if to have this exascale system, very energy efficient exascale systems, then we would need 
massive amounts of embedded memories uh, for such next generation systems. Now let's take a third case, which uh, emerging machine learning accelerator. So the figure on the left shows a generic representation of a deep neural network uh, framework. It consists of an input layer uh, with different vectors applied to it, consists of multiple hidden layers, and then an output layer which determines or classifies uh, the given inputs. And these different layers are interconnected with some weights associated with and that weight storage needs some memory uh, memory capacity and if you look at the recent uh, iscc uh, demonstration uh, you will see that many ml accelerators require more than again occupy more than 60 to 70 percent of the die area uh, for the memories and as the uh, size of this weight matrix or this connections between uh, these num different neurons and also the number of hidden layers as they increase over over a period of time, we would need larger and larger memory capacity for these efficient ML accelerators. So to illustrate this point further, this slide shows the accuracy of different emerging uh, convolution neural networks uh, and as a function of how many operations they perform for doing the inference uh, computation. And as you can see that for highly accurate networks, uh, the number of operations in general are increasing. And so is the size of the, uh, the model parameters, meaning the number of neural network weights, which is represented by the, the size of this circle that is also growing as we increase the complexity of the CNN. So what it means for the memory technology and memory design, how should we think about this memory specifications across the compute continuum? So starting with this, uh, this IoT segment all the way to the exascale computing system and the ML AI accelerators, one thing is clear that in a given form factor, large capacity memories are required across all segments. For example, in case of uh, IOTs and which are typically battery powered or in some cases battery less systems, low leakage becomes an important consideration. Whereas for the exascale system, high performance matter, but also it needs to be within a given energy budget. And hence, if you look at this entire spectrum from low end of IOT design to very high end uh, exascale systems, it is very clear that we need energy efficient memories across the entire compute continuum. So let's look at what is happening for this embedded memories uh, in terms of the scaling, how the advanced FinFET technology nodes is helping or enabling this bit self scaling trend. So this plot shows the embedded memory bit cell area uh, in terms of uh, micrometer square, again, which is plotted in the log y axis as a function of technology node. And you can translate that also or as a time axis. And this data is derived from various uh, ISCCC, IEDM, VLSI symposium papers. And specifically, these data points are extracted from high volume, uh, commercially available technologies uh, and where um, this bit cell area numbers are disclosed. And in this plot, I'm specifically talking only about the embedded memories, which are monolithically integrated along with the, uh, the logic transistors. So starting with the SRAM, uh, static random access memory bit cells, uh, also the embedded DRAM, uh, resistive RAM, as well as the magnetic RAM uh, technologies. So one can note that if you look at the static random access memory bit cell trend, which is shown in this top left set of curves, it is, it is scaling down into the five nanometers and also now nowadays into three nanometer technology node and having uh, a scaling trend with the, initially it was around 0.5 X per technology generation. And in current generations, the deep FinFET technologies, the very advanced FinFET technologies 
the scaling is in the range of 0.6 to 0.8 depending on which technology node or which uh, company you're looking at. So the SRAM scaling is happening, but at a much slower uh, uh, scale compared to the historic trends. And if you look at the these embedded memories, which one is the dominant one across uh, all of this, the SRAMs, EDRAMs, RERAMs, and MRAMs? So if you look at the uh, floor plan of any commercial microprocessors, and for illustration, I have used uh, two examples from Intel microprocessors. You could see that this uniform floor plan areas are essentially the memory arrays. And more than 70 to 80% of the die area is occupied by the SRAMs, the static random access memory. And, and SRAM happens to be the dominant M, the embedded memory technology of choice because of its attribute of simple integration with the logic transistors, as well as it can offer very high performance compatible with the rest of the high performance logic transistors. And that's why SRAMs is predominantly used for this high performance uh, designs. So when you are talking about the SRAM design, the static random access uh, memory design, what are the different aspects as a circuit designer uh, we need to consider? So if you look at this plot, it's essentially SRAM design a very multi-dimensional design process, starting with all the way from the bit cell design to uh, the VMIN circuit assist techniques in order to lower the operating voltage of the memory array, along with the peripheral array circuitry, such as the sense amplifier, decoders, and drivers. And in addition to the, the design aspect, we also need to care about some of the architectural techniques, such as the air correcting uh, codes. We also have to uh, care about the reliability aspects, the process integration aspect, the leakage, and the power management aspects. So in reality, a modern SRAM design is no longer just a pixel design, but the, all the facets that are represented on this, uh, on, this, uh, on this design curve. So what are the different kinds of SRAM bits that are, that are being explored, that are being uh, researched? So if you do a literature study, you will find that there are many variants of SRAM bits starting all the way from four transistor designs all the way up to 16 transistor bit cells. Some of them are single-ended uh, operations. Some of them are, uh, they employ differential mode operation. Uh, some of them have separate read and write ports in order to perform uh, very optimized read and write operations. And some of these uh, bit cells, the SNM bit cell, are designed for very special purpose, for example, radiation hardened bit cells or some application specific bit cells such as bit cells for sub threshold or extreme low voltage operation uh, another application is for the state retention in the power management domain which is also known as a non volatile uh, sram design so if you look at all of these bit cell uh, topologies we find that for the high performance design predominant bit cell uh, topology, uh, the, the topology of choice is the six transistor SRAM bit cell, which is typically used in the level two and the level three cache. And as I mentioned earlier, that occupies a significant portion of the total diarrhea. The eight transistor one read, one write register files typically are used for a level one cache because they have to support the simultaneous read write operations for in order to feed in, in and out the data to the central processing unit. And then this 10 transistor bit cells, which are uh, used for extremely low voltage or sub threshold voltage uh, applications. So let's start with this, uh, the most frequently used bit cell, the six transistor SRAM bit cell. So what is a six transistor SRAM bit cell is? So it consists of six different transistors. It has one word line, two bit lines, and these bit lines uh, store, uh, or this bit cell stores data in a complementary format. The access transistors AXL and AXR, they're also known as the pass gate transistor. 
and they enable uh, reading and writing mechanisms through this cross-coupled inverter pair. The PL and PR are called as the pull-up transistor, and NL and NR are also called as the pull-down transistor. And as I mentioned, word line enables the bit cell access, and the bit lines determine whether this is a read operation or a write operation. And the key attribute is the data is stored in the complementary form, zero and one form, as long as the supply volt VCC is active and there is no real data refresh that is happening in this memory cell and hence the name static uh, memory bit cell. And as I said, this is the dominant memory technology used for high performance embedded applications. So let's look at some of the basics and see how exactly this SRAM bit cell has evolved, how designers were able to come up with the 60 uh, bit cell structure. So let's start with a simple CMOS inverter. It has an input of VA and output VB. And when VA is zero, VB is one and vice versa. We are also familiar with the inverter transfer characteristics when, where we plot the output VB as a function of input VA. And then we plot the transfer characteristics that as VA is going from zero to VCC, how VB is responding to that. And then we have studied earlier that uh, in earlier like a VLSI classes that this type of inverter has a noise margin where we have the gain of minus one both on the high side and the low side. And it also has an ideal inverter has a switching threshold right at VCC by two where V in is equal to V out. Now the question is, this is a combinational logic. This does not have an inbuilt storage mechanism. So the, the question is, how do I enable a data storage mechanism in this structure, which intrinsically doesn't have any data storage mechanism? For example, in this inverter, VB output is actively driven based on the input. In order for VB to have any value, it needs a constant input uh, activation. But for a storage purpose, the question for us is how to maintain these node voltages without using any external input? But how can I still keep the VB voltage without having driven by an external VA input? And that's where cross-coupled inverter structure comes into a picture. Let's say we have two inverters, one with the VA as the input and VB as the output and the vice versa, where the second inverter has VB as the input and the VA as the output. Now, if I connect these two dotted lines such that I form a, a, a cross-coupled inverter pair, what would happen is the output of the first inverter drives the input of the second inverter and the node voltages, they are retained without externally driven input. And thus, we are enabling a memory storage capability or memory storage functionality using just a combinational logic gates, which by themselves don't have that memory storage capacity. And this structure is classically known as the cross-coupled inverter pair. And as you can notice that, VA and VB are storing the complementary voltages. Now, when you store these data values in, a, in this complementary fashion, this another set of question comes is, in order to get a very robust data storage functionality, how do we make sure that this structure is stable and immune to this noise, any noise events, and able to retain this data uh, very uh, in a in a robust manner. So let's look at some of the noise analysis uh, matrix. And this brings us to what is called as the SRAM butterfly curve. So let's start with this inverter, VA input, VA, VB is the output, and let's try to draw the transfer characteristics uh, as shown by this red line. Let's take another inverter, VB, at being the input, VA being the output, and let's try to plot its own transfer characteristics with VA plotted on the Y axis and VB plotted on the X axis. And also note that uh, 
when VB is equal to zero, VA is equal to VCC, and I'm denoting it by a little triangle over here. And then on the other side, I'm denoting this end with a little small circle here. Now notice that for these two uh, graphs, the X and Y axis are interchanged. So in order to see the combined effect of this cross-coupled inverter pair, what I can do is I can swap the axis such that VB comes on the Y axis and VA comes on the X axis to be consistent with this graph. So what is happening is the circle point here has really transformed from X axis onto the Y axis. And this triangle point has now transformed onto the bottom right corner. And what I can do is in order to get the transfer, the, the stability characteristics of this cross coupled inverter pair, I can superimpose these two graphs uh, on, the, on one another having the same X and Y axis. And this brings us to something called as the, the butterfly characteristics of an SRAM bit cell, the blue and the green. These two lobes are like the wings of a butterfly and hence the name a butterfly curve. So how exactly this butterfly curve gives us the bit cell stability. So let's take an example that at VA node, we experience a noise event of this much magnitude shown by this uh, green waveform. So we can project this waveform onto this XY axis onto the VA axis. And let's say this is the noise magnitude at the VA node, which I'm denoting with this arrow a, small a. It will get projected onto this red line, which is the transfer characteristics of the, the top inverter. And because it is in the low gain region, it will have a very small disturbance at the VB node shown by this pink line. And because it is a cross coupled structure, there is a feedback mechanism. The, the noise at the B node, which is shown by this pink waveform, will further get applied onto the uh, uh, onto the bottom inverter as shown over here. It will get projected onto this blue line and its magnitude will be reduced. And if you do one more iteration, it will be further uh, attenuated. Meaning thereby, because of this low gain region of this cross coupled inverter, when the loop gain is less than one, the noise disturbance at any input is suppressed and that will not result in a bit flip or switching the or toggling the cell nodes. And hence we are getting the uh, cell stability. Let's take in another example that the same transfer characteristics the butterfly characteristics, but instead on the VA node, I get a noise event of a significantly larger magnitude shown by this uh, bottom green curve. And if I try to project this onto the VA VB axis, it will project onto this red curve, the transfer characteristics of the top inverter at this point, then it will get projected onto the bottom inverter characteristics, which is shown by this blue line over here. So qualitatively, what is happening is a strong noise uh, amplitude here is creating a significant dip at the output of the VB. And that is resulting in a uh, bit flip event. So if the noise amplitude is too much, it is such that the loop gain is more than one, then we will have a bit failure event. And how do we actually quantify the goodness of this noise immunity? So there is a matrix called as the static noise margin, SNM, that is used to quantify the bit cell noise immunity. So how exactly the read operation happens in a 60 SRAM bit cell? So assume that the left node VL is storing zero, the right node VR is storing a one. And for the read operation, both bit lines are precharged to one. 
and the word line is asserted. So when the word line goes high, depending on which side is storing zero, there is a voltage divider action between this access transistor AXL and the pull down device NL, which is storing a zero. And a result, the zero storing node goes up as shown by this blue curve. But if this rise in the VL node, or this called, we call as this rise as the V read voltage, if that V read voltage increases or goes beyond the trip point or the switching threshold of the right side inverter, which is storing one, that may result in a bit flip event. And this phenomena is called as the read failure event. So the read failure criteria for, for a 60 bit cell is that the V read voltage, which is storing a zero, if it exceeds the V trip of the side, which is storing one, during a read operation, that might result in a bit flip. And these bit flips can happen due to either process variations, voltage variations, or temperature variations. So let's look at the write operations, how exactly we perform the write operations. So let's assume that the left node is storing one and the right node is storing a zero. And we want to write one to the node storing zero. So what we do is, we drive the bit line BL to zero, BR to one, depending on the data pattern that we want to write, and we assert the word line. And depending on the access transistor uh, strength, the VR node, which is storing zero, will be pushed uh, towards one, but the main contention happens between the PMOS device, which is storing a one, and an access transistor left axl which is trying to write a zero into it so there is a fight or some sort of a contention that is happening between this pmos and this access transistor so in most of the times the access transistor is a stronger than the pl and hence it is able to pull down this node vl node below the switching threshold of the right hand side inverter and as a result we get a successful write operation However, due to PVT variations, the process voltage and temperature variations, it may happen that the node which is storing one will not be able to be, will not be, will not get pulled down below the switching threshold of the other side of the inverter. And we may not be able to flip the bit as we have expected. And this results in a right failure event. So what is the right failure criteria? The right failure criteria for a 60 SRAM bit cell is that the V write or the, the voltage at which we, we want to write a zero or the, the node which was storing a one, if that voltage does not go below the trip point or the switching threshold of the other side of the inverter, that will potentially lead to a write failure scenario. So how exactly this read and write failures translate into the energy efficiency and the power consumption. So as you lower the supply voltage, the effect of this process variation gets uh, enhanced because of the lower transistor override, the VGS minus VT overdrive goes down. And as a result, there comes a point that we are no longer able to lower our operating voltage below a certain minimum point. And that voltage is typically called as the Vmin. It is the minimum operating voltage for successful operation of an SRAM array. So if you plot the distribution of these Vmin across different dyes and across different wafers, we find that there is a, uh, there is a distribution, uh, like we'll, we'll get some histogram. And if you look at this histogram, uh, you would find that these systematic variation which are the variations which are across all the dyes that determines the Vmin of the SRAM of the wafer. And the random variations or the local variations within each wafer would determine the Vmin of each die on that wafer. So this SRAM Vmin distributions are affected by global systematic and local random variations. Now, important thing to understand here is why does this Vmin matters? Many a times what happens is 
These SRAM arrays share the same supply voltage with rest of the logic core because I cannot afford dedicated voltage rails for each of the memory array. And SRAMs, they use six transistors to form one bit cell and they typically employ minimum geometry transistors in order to get a maximum bit density, maximum megabit per mm square matrix. And as a result of this minimum geometry transistors, uh, which are typically optimized for lower leakage, so they have a higher threshold voltage. And as a result, they experience a significant, uh, their circuit, significant impact of process variation as we try to lower the supply voltage. And hence, uh, they limit lowering of that supply voltage. And because they share the same supply rail with the rest of the logic, they sometimes can limit the overall supply voltage scaling of the entire SOC or of the entire product. And hence, it is very important to scale down the VMIN of these SRAM arrays, which employ this minimum geometry transistors. So why VMIN is big? or why this VT variation is becoming such a, a big deal in this advanced technology node. So if you look at this plot, this is a contour plot showing the Vmin spread as a function of transistor VT. So on the x-axis, we have a PMOS transistor VT. And on the y-axis, we have NMOS transistor VT. And these VTs can be set depending on the process optimization, depending on how we form our uh, fin transistors or a planar transistor structures. And if you have a higher VT transistor, which means the PMOS transistors are not able to hold logic one into that bit cell, it turns out that for a fast NMOS and a slow PMOS corner, meaning a low VT NMOS and a high VT PMOS corner, we will have more read failures than write failures. In other words, if my PMOS device is not strong enough to hold the logic one in that bit cell during a read operation, it will more likely to flip. On the other hand, on the y-axis, higher the NMOS transistor VT, which means I have a slow NMOS, a high VT NMOS, and a fast PMOS. In that case, because my PMOS device is so strong, that is able to hold logic one onto the cross-coupled inverter pairs, more strongly compared to the access transistor, which is trying to change it node voltage during a write operation, this type of scenario, it will be limited by a write operation. So if I have to find a sweet spot of uh, VT optimization, I will look for the this counter regions where it is the deep blue, where that means it has a very low Vmin. And now if you do the same exercise from 45 nanometer technology node into the 32 nanometer technology node, you will see that this blue region or this deep blue region, that region is shrinking down. Meaning thereby the sweet spot for getting very low Vmin in this VT optimization space is getting smaller or is getting smaller and smaller. Meaning if because of process variation, if there is any deviation from this deep blue region, I will end up in having higher women. And this is also amplified by the fact that in the basic 60 SRAM bit cell, there is a conflicting design requirement between a read and a write operation. And the, this is due to the fact that we are using the same pair of access transistors to perform the read operation as well as to perform the write operation. During read operation, we don't want the bit cell to flip. We want the bit cell to retain the data as strongly or as robust way as possible. But during the write operation, we want the bit cell to be flipped as easily as possible. It should be easy to write into the bit cell. And we are trying to do the same thing using the same set of transistors. And hence, fundamentally, there is a conflicting design requirements. And on top of that, we have the shrinking VT optimization window uh, when we scale from one process generation to the next generation because of this increased uh, process variation effect. And because of these two things, getting low women in advanced SRAMs becoming extremely challenging. And we need to come up with a lot of innovative ideas, both at the process level device level 
circuit level and also at the architecture and higher levels to meet the VMIN target. So what are the different kinds of process variations that we see uh, in this advanced geometry structures? So these variations could be because of the random dopant fluctuations. It could be because of the variations in the metal work function. It could be variations in the oxide thickness at such nanoscale dimensions. Or it could be due to the gate length variation because of the process, uh, the, the photolithography uh, imperfections that resulted into line edge roughness called as the LER. So if you look at the variation in the threshold voltage of the transistors, the sigma VT, the standard deviation in the VT variation, has a trend which goes uh, as follows, that it is inversely proportional to the square root uh, of the channel area. And as we shrink the devices, this denominator is going down. And hence, in general, the sigma VT number is going up. And hence, the process engineers, device engineers has to come up with very innovative ways to keep this sigma VT number at a much lower value. So what are the changes that are happening in the, in the Bitzel layouts or Bitzel design space? So the significant changes has happened over a period of time. The first one is the restricted design rules in the advanced technology um, nodes. For example, if you look at the 90 nanometer SRAM bits layout, uh, it used to have bidirectional feature. So if you can locate this poly line, which is the gate connection between this PMOS and this NMOS of one inverter, this is another inverter forming the cross coupled structures. And this lateral poly line that you see here, it is essentially the word line access transistor. So the poly orientation were in two directions. Because it was a planar st structure, the critical dimension, the channel length and the width, it can be optimized in a continuous manner. And the pitches, the separation between these poly regions was also variable. And there used to be diffusion and poly jogs and corner rounding effects. As you can see here, there is some corner rounding effects. This is the diffusion region and the poly is crossing this diffusion, forming the two PMOS transistors here. So many such imperfections were happening in, in, a, in a 90 nanometer technology node. If you fast forward to 22 nanometer technology node, this is a, again a snapshot from an Intel FinFET uh, SRAM bit cell, which is a high density bit cell having every device having only single fin the key differences you will notice that this is a unidirectional feature, meaning all poly lines or all gate electrodes are oriented in one direction. There is a limited gate CD. The critical dimension between the gate electrode is very limited as opposed to the variable in the previous approaches. And this layout is very greeted or is very quantized and having very fixed uh, pitch uh, how these fins are being placed one after another. And because it is a fin-fed structure, we don't have the luxury of setting the device width, the, the, the W of the transistor, the way we want. The width is now quantized in the form of either one fin or two fin. So because it is, and that has some limitations on the read versus write design techniques. So what we need to do, once we do this device level improvisations or the process level uh, changes in order to keep the process variations uh, to a minimum level. We now need to come up with the circuit assist techniques in order to meet such aggressive women goals in this advanced technology nodes. So there is a lot of device and circuit co-optimization that goes on in this advanced FinFET modes. So if you look at the the six transistor SRAM bits layout in modern technologies, it is typically a two poly pitch layout. So this is one poly or one gate electrode. This is the another set of gate electrode and the separation between this is one poly pitch and on the two sides is half the poly pitch. So the total Y dimension is like a two poly pitch. And you can imagine these contacts are shared across the 
edges uh, along this periphery. So which means this bit cell can be flipped both in the X direction and also Y direction so that this contact spaces uh, can be shared across adjacent bit cells. In addition to this, it has four diffusion tracks. The middle two ones are the, and the PMOS transistors uh, in this bit cell as shown in the schematic. The one on the uh, the one that is continuous along this polyline, along this gate, is that NFET, which is the pull-down transistor of one of the inverter. And this is really forming one inverter. This is forming the another inverter of the 6T structure. And at the two corners, on the diagonal corners of this, is essentially the pass gate or the access transistor. And the storage nodes, VL and VR, are essentially the diffusion connections uh, which are not shown here, but electrically you can imagine these VRs and these regions are connected so that this forms a cross-coupled inverter structure. So it is very important for us to analyze how exactly these modern SRAM bit cells are uh, laid out, and this is in a thin cell uh, geometry. So next, let me move on to the circuit level techniques in order to lower the, uh, the V-min of the SRAM arrays. So starting with the read assist uh, techniques. So there are various ways one can improve the read stability of the SRAM bit cell. Is essentially we are trying to increase the gate to source voltage of the PMOS transistors trying to hold the logic one. And this can be done by increasing the global VDD. So what is done is the supply voltage of the of the inverter pair is increased. The word line voltage is also increased. So it is as if you are, the entire bit cell is operating at a higher voltage compared to the rest of the periphery. So that is one approach. The other approach is we can increase the separation between the supply and down of the cross coupled inverter pair by intentionally lowering the ground voltage of this uh, pull down pull down and MOS devices. So that is the negative bit cell VSS. And that provides us the read stability improvement. But also for both of these approaches, we have to be careful about the transistor reliability because at very high voltage, we cannot boost the voltage above uh, the reliability limits of these nanoscale transistors. The other approach is uh, we can increase the voltage only for the cross-coupled inverter pair as shown over here so that the NMOS and PMOS devices here, they have a higher overdrive voltage, higher gate drive, and hence they are able to retain the bit cell nodes very, uh, very uh, in a robust way uh, compared to the uh, nominal supply voltage at this cross-coupled inverter. And the most preferred way of the that is used for the improving the read stability is called as the word line underdrive circuit WLUD and you will see this name in many recent uh, publications. So what is done is word line gate voltage is intentionally lowered so that the access transistor is weaker compared to the pull up transistor and hence the access transistor won't be able to inject too much current into the storage node and hence we get improved uh, read stability. So we are improving the read stability, but at the expense of increase in the access time, because of the weaker uh, access transistor, the read current is reduced, and hence it takes more time to develop bit line differential between this bit line and bit line bar, and which will be then sensed by a sense amplifier. So the read speed goes down, but the read stability improves. And this is just one illustration how uh, industry is adopting this read assist technique. And in this specific example, uh, what is done is this word line driver circuit is intentionally driven with a slightly lower voltage for the beginning uh, of this read uh, word line portion. And after sufficient bit line is developed, then this underdrive circuitry is disabled and then we raise the word line voltage all the way to the regular supply voltage 
And because of that, because of doing this partial suppressed word line approach, we could get 5% gain compared to doing everything using a conventional underdrive way. So there are various kind of a combinations you can think of, of creating this uh, word line underdrive circuit. And also various ways, not just only this pull down device base, but there are various mechanisms uh, one can think of, of creating this underdrive voltage levels. Now, let me talk about the writability. Now, what has happened is over a technology uh, generations, because of uh, stress and strain engineering that is used to improve the mobility or the on current of both PMOS and NMOS transistor, what has happened is the on current improvement in PMOS has been a lot more compared to the corresponding NMOS uh, scaling trend. And as a result, the effective beta ratio between the PMOS and NMOS has gone down from 90 nanometer to 32 nanometer technology node, and it is kind of shrink even further in 22 nanometer node. So what it means is, because the PMOS is getting stronger and stronger, it makes it means it is getting harder and harder to perform the SIM write operation. And it is evident that if you look at the contribution of this PMOS device, in overall write failures across the technology nodes, this contribution is increasing. And hence, we need to come up with the ways to suppress this effect of this stronger PMOS effect, making our write operation difficult. So there are various write assist techniques that SRAM designers employ. The one way to do uh, to overcome the stronger PMOS device is to increase the strength of the access transistor. And the way to do it is by boosting the word line voltage. And this comes at the cost of increased power consumption. And also we cannot boost the word line voltage when you are already operating at the maximum uh, voltage set by the reliability limits. The other approach is instead of uh, boosting the word line, what if, if we raise the VSS at this cross coupled inverter pair? Because of that, the zero, which is initially represented at like logic zero, initially represented at zero voltage, it is now will be represented with some raised voltage value. And as a result, it will be easier to flip the bit cell. So there is a writability improvement and there is a slight increase in the write delay. So, so these are every assist has some pros and some cons associated with it. Another important uh, write assist approach is the negative bit line approach. This is also called as the NBL. And this is the term you will see in the literature quite often. So what is done is instead of boosting the word line, what if, if I lower the source voltage of the word line, which is trying to write a zero? Because the write failure is initiated when an access transistor is no longer able to pull the node, which is storing one, below the trip point of the other side of the inverter. So in order for the provide the assist to the access transistor, the other mechanism is, is to lower the zero bit line voltage below the ground level. And that is what is called as the negative bit line uh, write assist technique. So again, it has increased power consumption. There is also the access transistor reliability limit, especially at the Vmax operating condition. And also there is a possibility that there is a leakage from unselected cells which are connected onto the same bit line, but which are not doing any active read write operation. And another important method for the write assist is the supply voltage collapse. It is also called as the VDD collapse. So what is done here is intentionally this cell supply voltage is lowered during the write operation, either for the entire duration or only for a slight duration and because of that the pmos access on the pmos pull up transistor is intentionally uh, weakened so that the access transistor can overcome the contention and can flip the bit cell easily and the drawback is it has increased power consumption because i have to move this column voltage supply voltage not just for this bit cell but for the all the bit cells which are connected to the same column and again we have to bring it back so there is a some 
dynamic capacitance cost. There is a uh, increase in the write completion because now the completion is not happening at the full voltage, but at a reduced voltage. And there is a possibility of retention of unselected bit cells on the same column. What if, if I try to lower this voltage too low such that it affects the retention of unselected bits which are sharing the same supply voltage uh, for that column. So there are various mechanisms, various uh, design demonstrations where uh, in every column there were two supplies that were routed and depending whether it's a read operation or the write operation, one of the two supplies are chosen using some MUX, like a supply MUX. And during the write operation, the voltage of that column was intentionally lowered all the way to the data retention voltage DRV. And then when the write operation, that word line is terminated, then the voltage is brought up back to the nominal levels. So this works when uh, to some extent, but it has a very limited benefit when your cell voltage itself is close to the data retention voltage. In other words, if your starting V core voltage is close to the data retention voltage, what is the minimum voltage that is required in order to retain the data on this cross coupled bit cells, then the separation between the two is very small and hence we'll get very limited benefits in terms of VMIN improvement. And there are also uh, other issues that can happen with this uh, uh, low column voltage approach that if you recover this too soon, that it may not be able to flip the bit cells. These are the storage nodes. We may not be able to flip the bit cells completely. If you do it at an optimal level, we would be able to uh, flip the bit in a nice way. But if you do the recovery too late, there are scenarios where the bit cell, although they have flipped, but because they have not done the completion operation, after the word line goes down, the bit nodes would actually come back to their original state. So these scenarios can also happen when you try to lower the voltage for a sustained duration. So in order to avoid these issues, what many engineers come up with is called as the transient voltage collapse. So instead of lowering this bit cell voltage in a static way, what if, if I lower it only in a transient way, and even if I reduce this node one, this node one is not going to go all the way to zero because this PMOS, which is trying to discharge this node through this collapsing VCC, this is not going to let this node go beyond the VTP, the threshold voltage of this PMOS transistor. And hence you will see that the voltage at node N1 is kind of get clipped at the VTH of this PMOS. So when we recover this voltage back, the VCS back, because one node N1 is at VTH, the other node is close to zero, because there is still some differential that exists and that differential will amplify to the full rail voltage when you bring back this VCS. And hence, this type of transient voltage collapse, even even if you go this voltage all the way down to zero for a short amount of duration, it still maintains the data for all the unselected cells which are sharing the same column. If you do it for a too long duration, then of course there is a the, the data retention risk. But if you do it very um, in a momentary scale, then we can maintain the data in a, in a reliable way. The other assist technique I have mentioned, which is also predominantly used, is the negative bit line uh, technique. And instead of writing a zero onto a bit line, we are writing a negative voltage on the bit line. Now the question is, how do we generate a voltage which is below zero volt? And for that purpose, a capacitive coupling type of approach is used, where this capacitor C1 is initially connected to this NVSS of this world of this bit line driver. And when this is at zero, this node is floated and this capacitor is intentionally pulled down. And because of this coupling between this capacitor and the and the capac the bit line capacitance, depending on that ratio, you will get the bit line voltage, which is slightly below the ground. And hence, we are, thus we are creating a negative bit line voltage in a self-contained manner. 
So, so far I have discussed uh, the bit cell scaling trend, the bit cell design, and then I moved on to the assist techniques. But for a complete foolproof design, this SRAM array design, what are the, some of the other considerations? And I'll briefly touch upon only a couple of them. But as you can imagine that I have shown in the beginning that designers have to worry about or have to consider many, many aspects before qualifying that technology. So let me point out to some of the important uh, effects that we have to worry about in advanced uh, FinFET type of technologies. And that is to do with the word line and bit line RC interconnect effect. Now, if you think about it, the word lines and bit lines typically are routed into very lower metal levels, such as M0, M1, and M2 metal levers. And this advanced technologies, SRAM arrays are probably the only place where you have such long metal lines in local interconnects. Typically for the logic cells, when you're doing the routing between the two logic cells, it is only for the short distance for one logic gate driving the another logic gate. But in case of SRAMs, where we are trying to improve the bit density and the array density, we are trying to pack as many bits as possible on a given word line and a bit line, the resistance and capacitance or the RC interconnect of this word line and bit line, especially because they are at the lowest metal level, which are most resistive in this advanced nodes, they become an, uh, a serious issue. So what is done here is, uh, so this shows the bit line RC effect and how it affects, for example, the negative bit line voltage at the near end as, as well as the far end. So in order to mitigate this RC inter interconnect effects, what is done is on the bit line side, a long bit line is intentionally broken into two segments. So the lower segment, uh, which is close to the sense amplifier, which is close to the IO circuit, it is routed in the local, in the lower metal level, let's say an M2 metal layer. And the bit cells, which are farther away from this sense circuit, at midpoint, they are intentionally routed to a higher metal layer and a higher metal layer will have a lower RC interconnect. So overall, we get, a, a, like a, overall, we get a 40% improvement in the access time. For example, if you look at this bit line discharge time without this flying bit line and with, a, with this flying bit line, you will see a significant improvement in the access time. Similarly, on the word line, what is done is instead of word line being driven with some lower metal level uh, layer, what is done is this intentionally, the, there is another parallel path for this word line that is provided. And this is scheme is also called as the double word line scheme. Sometimes the word line repeaters are used or sometimes the word lines are driven from two sides of the array. So there are many such combinations are possible. And one, because of combin, combining this flying bit line uh, and double word line scheme, uh, engineers are able to get significant improvement in the overall access time and to improve the performance by around 40% in advanced FinFET technologies. So, so far we have talked about the 60 SRAM, but in a, in a given microprocessor, as especially in the level one cache, you will see another type of bit cell, which is also called as the eight transistor SRAM bit cell, or it is also called as the one read, one write port SRAM bit cell. And it is used for level one cache or the register files. And because they have the decoupled read and write ports, one can perform the back-to-back -back operation by conditioning their bit lines in a proper way. And if we don't use any column multiplexing, then this read and write can be optimized independently and we can get much lower women compared to a 60 bit cell counterpart. And of course, because it's an 80 bit cell, it is slightly bigger in, in footprint compared to the 60. And this is typically uh, 20 to 30% larger area compared to a 60 bit cell. This is a generic floor plan of an 80 SRAM array that it consists of this different bit cells, let's say 32 bits, connected to a local bit line. And this local bit line is fed to a local sense circuit, which could be just a NAND gate. And then there is a hierarchical global bit lines. And 
Also, typically it employs a lot signal sensing as opposed to the differential sensing because of the single ended read operation. Another type of bit cell that you will also notice is uh, in high performance design is, is also called as the dual port SRAM or two read write port SRAM. So these type of bit cells are typically suitable for parallel operations in many uh, image processing units. And because I have two dedicated pairs of access transistor, two ports, the memory access rate of this dual ported SRAM is doubled compared to a single port SRAM at the same while operating at the same clock frequency. So this slide shows the schematic of a dual port 8T SRAM. All we are doing is adding uh, additional pair of access transistors and additional pair of bit line pairs so that not only one port but two ports can perform the read and write operations. And this is the bit cell uh, footprint. And because we are sharing the same pair of access transistor, although the cell area is bigger compared to a single 60 bit cell, but it is much smaller compared to having two different 60 bit cells. And hence there is a need for this dual ported SRAMs. So in addition to this, as I mentioned earlier, we have to worry about various other effects such as the leakage effect, the impact of temperature variations, how can improve the, the efficacy of the these circuit assist techniques, and what are the different impacts of aging and reliability onto the SRAM and what on its V-min. Uh, we also see some cases where we see erratic fluctuations of SRAM V-min. And also we have to worry about the soft errors, the bit flips that happen because of the high energy particle striking on these storage nodes. So, uh, so this field is, the SRAM design is a lot more intense and a lot more multidimensional, uh, as I mentioned. And we had to take care of many, many such uh, issues in order to, before we qualify, before we certify that this technology is ready for uh, commercial adoption. So let me move on to the, the last part of my talk, which is the SRAM for the compute in memory designs. So what exactly is the compute in memory design? So if you look at the traditional von Neumann architecture, memory is, is separated from the compute unit. And there is a huge amount of data transfer to and from memory. And that result in a, in a latency overhead as well as the energy overheads in order to move this data to and from the memory. So the idea is instead of bringing the data from memory to the compute, what if, if, if I move the compute functionality itself in the memory array and embed within that memory array itself? So because of that, I will have less data transfer there, so that will be more energy efficient. And furthermore, because I have multiple word lines and bit lines in a memory array, that will be I will get more parallel operations, which are a lot more in number. And hence, I could get a higher internal computational bandwidth and hence more energy efficient design. And that's the basic principle behind this compute in memory or CIM design approaches. Now, if you look at the literature, you will see various scenarios uh, how uh, different researchers use this CIM. So starting with the left most, which is the conventional way of using memories, bringing the data from various banks of memories to the compute unit, then using a, a hybrid memory, high, high bandwidth memory using this TSVs by stacking different memory dies, but still keeping them separated from the uh, compute units. Then there is a memory plus compute that you are bringing a processing unit close to the uh, set of memory arrays. And then we could do it at a very fine granularity and we can call this processing in memory. And the ultimate uh, form of this compute in memory is performing this computation inside the memory array using word lines, bit lines, and some peripheral circuits, such as the decoders and the sense amplifier. And this happens mostly in analog or mixed signal way. So if you look at this, the way the compute has evolved, you can clearly see that this computing has moved nearer and nearer to the memory bit cell. 
So essentially, we started with compute with large memory. And then somewhere in the middle, we are doing computation near the memory array. And at the very far end, very the right-hand side, here we are exploring the ways to do in-memory computing using the word line and bit line, uh, not only for just read-write purpose, but also for doing basic uh, computational operations. So there is a huge uh, area of research, a lot of uh, active investigation that is happening in the computing memory space. So for today's talk, I'll just give you like a one slide kind of overview. Uh, so for neural network design, one important thing is to perform the, to feed these inputs and then perform this dot products or matrix multiplications. And there are various ways one can feed the inputs using word lines and bit lines. So one can play with the word line pulse width and feed in different uh, bit precision inputs onto the memory array. We can also change the uh, word line amplitude. We can also do the same thing with the bit line amplitude. We can also split the access transistor into two dedicated uh, uh, word lines, the left and right. And by doing so, we can use them to do it uh, to feed the word lines, uh, to feed the data uh, to the memory arrays. So I won't go into the details of this, but I encourage you to uh, look at these references that are mentioned over here and also look at some of the uh, the review papers in this compute in memory design space. So that's bring me to the uh, end of this presentation. So let me summarize uh, today's presentation about this energy efficient memories. So in the beginning, we discussed how energy efficient and high performance memories are critical across the compute com continuum, starting with the very low end compute end of the spectrum, which is the IoT space, then moving on to the exascale systems, and then moving on to the ML AI accelerators. And in today's world, in the FinFET technologies, the SRAM scaling and the VMIN scaling is achieved by a very tight optimization, design technology circuit optimization, in short, the DTCO uh, across uh, process technology and also using the circuit assist techniques. And in addition to this VMIN, there are other aspects that one needs to consider before uh, making this technology a mature and ready for high volume manufacturing. And recently there has been emergence of this ML AI accelerators. And in order to get uh, energy efficient designs, in-memory computing is becoming an active area of research various ways and not just SRAM memory technologies, which is the predominant embedded memory technologies, but researchers are looking into RERAM based, MRAM based, even embedded DRAM based computing memory designs. But one thing is for clear that if you look at the future data centric computing uh, paradigms, in that scenario, energy, the overall energy of our computing compute system is going to be a very, very strong function of memory technology. And hence, we need to work not just at one layer of abstraction, but all the way starting from materials to devices to process integration, to 3D integration, to circuit level techniques, to the architecture and going beyond, and then work across this cross the layers to get the best possible energy efficiency in order to meet the future needs of this data centric computing world. So with that, uh, I will conclude my presentation and I'll be more than happy to take your questions. And thank you very much once again for inviting me and uh, listening patiently through this presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jidip. Thank you. So does anyone, does anyone have a question about the presentation for JDIP? You should write, your, write them in the chat. Um, maybe I can start with a question on my end then. Um, sure. In terms of uh, in-memory computing, uh, 
there's a lot of work uh, going on at the moment for this, but where is the limit to in-memory computing? Because if it's so efficient, why don't we do all the memories in that way? Yeah, uh, that's a that's a very good question. So, so if you look at a memory structure or memory uh, floor plan or memory organization, we have word lines, bit lines, and the bit cell nodes. And the way they are originally designed is to perform the read, write, and retention operation. Now, what we are trying to do is to create additional set of uh, functions using the same set of uh, circuits that are available to us. So there is a limit on how many or how much of such computations or to what degree that we could tweak these word lines and bit lines to perform this computation. For example, we could do like a logical bitwise operations or some one bit of maybe a couple of bits or dot products onto this. But anytime we try to increase the bit precision, we are going into more and more into analog domain. And hence, uh, getting that high precision analog computation within this memory array becomes challenging. It becomes more of a data conversion issue that we have to do A to D and D to A conversion. And how do you do it effectively so that these memories will be used as regular memories in a non-CIM mode, and but they also need to be used as, a, as an efficient CIM design. But if you have overhead because of this data converters, for example, which is which is going to reduce or which is going to lower your megabit per mm square number, then it becomes a very hard, very difficult value proposition that how would industry would adopt this type of technology if the overhead of such peripheral circuit, which is only for CIM, becomes too much. And hence, the, the real kind of need, the research need here is that how do we come up with design ideas that reuse the existing memory array infrastructure as much as possible and yet that they should be able to serve both purpose as a regular memory array as well as CIM engine in the most optimal way. Uh, so that's the, the real uh, kind of the area of research at the moment. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have a question from Andreas Kieser. So in slide 37, I believe, you showed the dynamic supply. Why does supply's vault goes up slowly beyond a certain point? Uh, you, mean, you mean this red line? Why does the supply voltage goes up slowly beyond a certain point? Yeah, so let me explain this co concept again. So for the transient voltage collapse, the way this works is for, for improving the right beaming, we are trying to minimize the gate to source voltage of this PMOS transistors, which is trying to hold one, and which is opposing an access transistor, which is trying to rewrite a zero onto the storage node. So in order to do so, uh, we are trying to pull down this VCS node as quickly as possible, and then bringing it back. So this duration, this is shown just for the illustration purpose, but this can be controlled depending on how fast we are uh, driving this VCS node, the strength of the pull down and pull up transistors, which are connected to this VCS node. So this blue shape is kind of controllable. It's user defined or configuration dependent. What happens is when you uh, when this node voltage goes down all the way to zero, the VCS node, the storage node does not follow that uh, all the way down to zero because anytime the VCS goes below the threshold voltage of this PMOS transistor, it gets kind of clipped because this transistor is now turned off and it is no longer able to pass this VTH voltage all the way to ground through this VCS. And hence you will notice that this voltage at node N1 is going down. It is initially following this VCS, but it is kind of clipping or kind of getting saturated at this VTH PMOS point. And the other side is still at zero. So when you recover, because it has enough voltage differential between them, it can recover nicely to its original levels, the supply and ground voltage levels. And that's how 
we are able to retain the data on all the cells, all the cells which are on the same column, which are sharing the same VCS node. And even though that VCS node goes down and comes back quickly, we are still able to retain the data because of this PMOS getting clipped off at VTH point. Uh, does that answer your question? And yes. Will, uh, okay, so the next question is, will FinFET replace CMOS in future? FinFET is a CMOS transistor, and today's modern uh, processors from Intel, AMD, Samsung, for any Apple, NVIDIA, any company you name, are done in, are, are manufactured in advanced FinFET technologies, such as 10 nanometer FinFET, 7 and 5 and, and below. So FinFET is a CMOS. It just, instead of a planar CMOS, it is a three-dimensional or a, uh, like a three-dimensional transist MOSFET structure. Okay, so this will be our last question as we okay. are going a bit over the limits here. So okay. from Ashid Hossein, can you please explain the flybit line concept? Are we going to mute those? If it is near sense arms and it might increase the overall bit line cap, which might penalize bit time. Okay, so what is done in the flying bit line uh, scenario as shown over here, the bit cells which are closer to the sense amplifier, let's say your sense amplifier is placed over here. They are kept at the lower metal level. So their RC interconnect effect is not that dominant, but the bit cells which are farther away from this sense amplifier, what is done is they are split somewhere in midpoint and then they are routed using a higher metal line. Let's say this could be an M4 metal line, which is shown by this yellow line. What it means for the sense amplifier design is, instead of having two inputs of this bit line and bit line bar, it will have now four inputs because one because of this lower bit line pair and the one, the additional two inputs because of this upper bit line pair. And we need to include a MUX two is to one multiplexer at the input of the sense amplifier to choose either this lower level metal interconnect, which is shown in the blue, or this upper level bit line interconnect. So there is has to be some modification at the input of the sense amplifier, but that is not going to change on, that is not going to increase your bit line cap. It, in fact, it is going to reduce the bit line cap because we are splitting the bit line into half and half. Okay, so that's why we are uh, getting higher, like a better access speed using this flying bit line concept. Uh, does that answer your question? Mm. But uh, higher metal layer still has to reach sense amp. Yes, the higher metal layer still has to reach the sense amp, but the higher metal levels have lower RC compared to the lower metal layers, right? So the the yellow line here will have a higher metal M4 RC plus, which is only for the half the length, and then additional half length, it will come from this lower blue metal line, let's say in M2. The, what we need to find out is whether by splitting this, are we getting the net reduction in the bit line capacitance? Okay. Any other questions? One, one more question, access time or cycle time of memory, which comes in critical path of SOC design and why? So, so the access time is from, 
is defined as between the word line to send stamp output. And if you're performing more and more read operations, which is generally the case, then that becomes a critical path. Cycle times also consist of uh, the time it takes to precondition the bit lines. For example, you have to precharge the bit lines before a read operation. So, and also it's a synchronous design. So cycle time has some implications, but the access time is more of a point A to point B, and that is more critical uh, in the SOC design because reads are more frequent. And typically the way this is done is access time is uh, is defined or like uh, it's defined in terms of cycle times also like worst case access time is like one cycle time or two cycle times depending on how that clock is used internally to build the word line and bit line timings. Strange yeah, bitline technique to increase bit power. Uh, it does to some extent, but we are getting uh, higher performance. Okay. <clears throat> so this will conclude this this talk. Thank you very much, Jadeep, once again for for so this really nice presentation, and to all our viewers. Uh, please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and to follow us on LinkedIn. Okay. Thank you, Julian. Thank you, IEEE Lily Branch for hosting me and giving me an opportunity to share this work with you all. all right. Thank you very much and goodbye. See you later, everyone. Bye-bye.